Hey everyone, Brian Beeler and Kevin O'Brien coming to you from the Storage Review Lab. And today we're taking a look at the Dell PowerVault ME5. Now the ME5 is an entry storage system typically going to be sold in a hybrid configuration, so disk and flash, although there's plenty of combinations available. Uh, all flash is one of them. They even have a 2U24 bay version of this that where you could do flash across the front if you wanted to. Architecturally, this is a dual controller, kind of standard issue entry storage box, right? Yeah, so you're going to get uh, plenty of storage on the front, and uh, in this case, there's 32-gig uh, fiber channel support on the back. So they have 32-gig fiber, but they've got 10G. They've got some other stuff uh, that you can choose from, right? Yeah, so I mean, if you're an Ethernet or fiber channel shop, there's plenty to work with. Okay, and so part of the value of these systems is not so much in the IOPS and bandwidth and all of that stuff. We covered that already in the uh, deep dive, and, and we'll put a link to that in the... Uh, video description if you want to learn more and explore all of its capabilities. What's really neat about these systems, whether it's an SMB system or going into an SMB or going into an edge location like retail or even into a rugged uh, situation like oil and gas exploration on ships or wherever else these things might find themselves, the time to set up and configure can be really a big fundamental decision about whether you go with something like this or you roll your own or you pick a NAS or, or do some other thing, right? And some might have a lot of legwork involved. I mean, it could be hours to get something deployed and some minutes. So it, you're gonna, it, depending on the solution, it could fall somewhere in between there. All right, and so in this case with the ME5, Dell says it should be more along minutes, not hours to get operational. And so in this video, what we decided to do is let's not get so bogged down in the capabilities, but let's look at operationally day zero. What does it take to get this thing up and online? And what does that look like? And can we do it in 15 minutes or less, right? And I wasn't even here. You took young Connor under your wing to set this thing up, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these, I've worked with similar units in the past. It was kind of like, well, without instruction manual, what can I do by, on my lonesome self and it was with kind young of, Connor right well yeah it's just trying to figure out like can you really just do it without any prior knowledge and in this case it went pretty well well yeah and actually we had no prior knowledge and I'm I wouldn't argue that me being there would have helped any other Probably than not. the racking it's still it's not that heavy but still best to have two people to rack it and then you know we've used the me4 before we love that system this is just a progression of the dual controller architecture updated hardware, software, all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Um, so we unboxed, Kevin pulled up a console, hit record for posterity and for this video, and, and that was that, right? Yeah, it went really well. Okay, so let's dive into that video, and Kevin's gonna walk us through the entire process, and we'll see just how long it takes to get the ME5 online. So when you first log on to uh, the ME5, you're presented, you're given two static IP addresses, and uh, this lets you get it set up on no matter what your networking environment is, just kind of reassign your local IP addresses to something that aligns to um, maybe five. In this case, it's uh, 10.0.0.2 and three, and you ch you create your uh, default password. Um, and then you're presented with a screen where you can uh, change the firmware on the box. In this case, it had uh, two firmware of the same version pre-installed, uh, pre but you can select your own. Uh, if you wanted to uh, have a, a newer rev uh, than when you're deploying it. So each of those IP addresses is going to the two distinct controllers in the back of the box. Yeah, but you only need one to uh, hit the configuration that mirrors it onto the other side. Okay. Uh, and now you're going to be presented with uh, networking settings. Uh, we're using IPv4. Um, and this is one area where since I kicked off a firmware update, I went through and was going to change the IP addresses, but because a firmware update was taking place, it uh, wouldn't let me uh, continue. But it didn't really slow me down. I just kept the stack IP addresses to the configuration and then changed them uh, when we uh, uh, later on. But here you're able to uh, set up the uh, IP addresses for each controller, and um, you might want to make sure that uh, you have access to the other controller, uh, or both subnets, before you change it. Um, because otherwise you'd lose access during your initial configuration. But in this case, you can see we're doing a firmware update, so it won't let you do it, and we just backed it out and uh, basically skipped that uh, screen. <laughs> okay, so you have a, a self-inflicted time penalty right there, but not a critical issue. Yeah. Here you set up your DNS uh, information. Uh, we gave it our uh, internal... Um, actually, no, I didn't give it its internal DNS because it was still on static IP. 
Uh, you set the uh, date and time. You're going to use an uh, NTP server if you'd like. Uh, and then you can uh, create your um, uh, local uh, user settings, uh, SMP traps, things like that. Um, and then here we have manage standard and monitor uh, for the uh, default roles. Um, and then you can skip that if you want to. Support assist, uh, we didn't tie it into uh, that. So um, especially since it didn't have out, uh, outbound internet access at the time, uh, we just um, we skipped that uh, area since it wasn't required to uh, get the uh, system running. But you're given a lot of areas to uh, tie it into your account if you need to. But again, a little bit of self-inflicted wound, but it doesn't really slow us down. Uh, and then you get a little bit of pause before you can uh, start working on the storage configuration. But this type of screen, it's, it's pretty useful. You're given pretty concise steps. You click start, and then you roll through uh, those well, even, required Even screens. the little visual indicator like this is pretty useful. I mean, they would have, in the old days, sent a... Uh, like a four by six poster board with this kind of stuff on it to show you the process, right? Yeah, I mean, it works. You might have some reference guides, but uh, if you don't have anything available, it is nice to see like, okay, hit this IP address and follow the steps. Okay, so you're doing your firmware updates now. What are we... So right now it's waiting uh, for that activity to complete in the background before it highlights the uh, next step, which would be uh, storage configuration. Okay, so so far you've messed up the IPs once. Well, no, I did mess them up because I couldn't <laughs> it wouldn't, do it. It wouldn't let you. Yeah. Okay, so it protected you from messing up your IPs once while it was doing firmware. And you didn't do support assist, but you could do that. And then people could set up some of the notification traps and, and other, other things. Yeah, very basic uh, day zero type of activities to get things intertwine into your uh, local monitoring and status makeup of your uh, network environment. Well, and the other point too, I think, is for any channel uh, providers that that would take these and put them in customer sites, knowing that your field guy isn't going to be out there for half a day, configuring storage is, is pretty nice as well. Well, yeah, and obviously, I mean, you might not have people monitoring this locally, on, even on a day-to-day -day basis, not just day one or uh, day two, but you might want monitoring going back to who's ever handling support, like, hey, something uh, something got unplugged, a drive failed, shoot out a new drive to uh, the system. Those sorts of uh, monitoring activities help tie that in, especially with support assist if you can leverage that. So here uh, I refreshed the page and we got our store co uh, configuration and uh, we're going with a virtual pool type. Uh, so here, that's a mixture of uh, hard drives and SSDs, where the hard drives are automatically leveraged for, for capacity, and then the SSDs for a performance tier. And by the way, to prove we aren't speeding this video up at all, we could have done it right back there where we sat there and looked at the processes for yeah. about 58 seconds to, uh, to game the system. But this is very much a real-time uh, retelling of how you were provisioning this box. Yeah, in this case, we used uh, RAID 1 for uh, the two SSDs, <clears throat> and then we go back and uh, create a uh, RAID 6 group of the uh, remaining hard drives. You can see there, there uh, the initialization, it goes for quite a while, but it doesn't hold you up on uh, how you get that running. Right, so that's all the background housekeeping the system's doing to get that the, uh, the storage ready. Yeah, and through here, one thing that is pretty nice is uh, it gives you very much recommended settings of like, okay, you want, you're using RAID 5, RAID 6, here's the number of drives you should, ha you should have in a disk group. And so that was a very brave move for you because typically you would have plowed through and ignored, but it looks like you reconsidered your decision. Well, here I was thinking of uh, doing uh, two uh, RAID 6 groups uh, just to have it striped and maybe a little more performance, but the box really wants to uh, See, that, sway you in. That was very much a Kevin deployment move. <laughs> Check them all. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, well, that was one of the areas. It, one, it, you leverage certain multiples um, and you go that route. No, but fair point. It's protecting you a little bit in your deployment to make sure that you're setting it up optimally. Yeah. And if you had a, um, a larger unit, say the uh, 24-bay model or maybe um, additional SSDs and f uh, fewer hard drives, you could leverage uh, and build out uh, disk groups on both uh, pool A and pool B. So pool A is on controller A, pool B is on uh, uh, pool B. Controller or, B. Yeah, controller B. Right. And um, 
right now it would be an active passive type of configuration, but you can leverage as active active uh, for even greater performance. So right now you can see the SSDs are in an initial, initialization stage and then the uh, hard drives are in a preparation stage. So at this point you could plow forward, I suppose, um, but you're enjoying watching the build take place. Yeah, it's just making sure that uh, no errors pop up. Usually if something's like the top one where it's going at a couple, uh, like a percent every couple of minutes, um, I understand that thing's probably gonna be running for a while. On the other one, I was just making sure that uh, no errors popped up. Okay, and so again though, if we wanted to game it and we're trying to fly through as fast as possible, then, then that would have been a good spot. Yeah, and at that point you can pop right into the dashboard. You can still do provisioning uh, through that uh, utility, but you can jump right into the dashboard to see, hey, I have 67 terabytes of available capacity right now. How can I start provisioning it? Okay. And in this case, uh, we can kind of drill through see how the uh, thing got set up, make sure everything looks uh, normal for how we had it uh, running. Uh, the SSDs are still in their init stage, uh, the hard drives have finished, um, and everything is pretty much working the way you'd expect. Uh, like you, on that screen you can see the owner was um, the uh, controller, uh, controller A. I mean, if you had a failover and you pulled a controller out, it would just chunk it onto the other uh, controller. And so at this point, even though there's still some initialization work going on in the background, we're usable here, right? Yeah, everything is up and running and uh, you can start provisioning. Actually, I'm gonna jump into that uh, shortly. Um, and uh, you have to create your host first. So we had uh, some hosts that were uh, provisioned to the um, uh, array on our uh, uh, fiber channel network already. And um, we can start to see that um, Actually, I think here was where it is I have to provision onto the fiber channel network, and then once that's up and running, then we can uh, create the host profiles and uh, give it the LUNs. Okay. So here, uh, we you on the host screen, you get to see the hosts that are uh, presented on your storage fabric. In this case, since we just deployed it, I didn't intertwine into our uh, uh, Firewood channel switch zoning yet, but we can do a, a walk through the uh, rest of the uh, interface. And on here, uh, this is how I was actually able to see the uh, target IDs. And I was starting to copy and paste those out into a uh, script uh, that I would leverage for uh, uh, my fiber channel zoning. And uh, you get to see a lot of the health information. So in that case, you get to see your 32 gigabit uh, connection speed for fiber channel. Well, how did um, you break something already? It was still not doing anything yet. Well, it's just saying it didn't have connectivity to uh, Storage Assist. Okay, well, that's true. And you can acknowledge those, make those uh, little errors go away. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of that's just, you're gonna, when the first, when the system first comes online, most will start having little errors or little blips coming up, just saying like, hey, I'm, I'm alive, like what's up? Uh, and a lot of those, you will be acknowledging things or just suppressing those uh, to move past day zero uh, kind of false alerts type of uh, thing. Right, but support assist is very useful, so yes. you should definitely set that up if you're a ME5 customer. Yeah, and on here there's, on the back end settings, default settings are really good. And if you need to uh, change things, there's areas to, uh, they give you some flexibility there to uh, tweak things for very specific scenarios. Uh, and here you get to see your network settings again, so even if you didn't change it on your initial deployment, it's pretty easy to change it on the fly as needed. Um, and again, you get access into seeing your uh, connectivity. In this case, it's all fiber channel. Uh, it would be ethernet if you're running it as a uh, ethernet iSCSI host. Um, and it's just a really nice, cleanly laid out uh, environment. Yeah, I gotta say, Power Vault Manager is pretty clean in terms of these things and um, yeah, I mean, it, as a non-administrator, to me, it looks pretty darn easy to interact with. Yeah. So here we've uh, zoned it finally onto, uh, we've zoned our array onto our environment and we get to see uh, the hosts. And obviously th this is something where if you uh, wanna go ahead and uh, kick it off uh, during your initial deployment stage, you would see these guys right away. In our case, we just wanna be able to copy and paste them out of the interface into our uh, switch uh, scripts. And then from there, zone uh, got the single initiator zoning set up for it. Um, and we're creating our um, 
host profiles uh, for the hosts leveraged in this um, uh, testing. And we're, we have a bunch of uh, Dell R740s, and we just have a Dell R740, Dell R740 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, and this is a pretty quick process. You get to see the initiator IDs um, and you just assign it to a given host name. And, we're, and these are all dual port cards, so they all show up that, uh, in that manner. And once they're all configured, you have your chance to um, assign storage onto those hosts. Let me ask, you're gonna skip, yeah. What do you mean skip? There was a skip option, wasn't there? Well, I don't always skip everything. <laughs> But you, it, it works pretty easily. It's, everything is pretty straightforward on a, you're provisioning the storage, you start provisioning LUNs, you start creating your host groups. Um, and if you have a VMware host group, for example, you have a bunch of hosts that are all sharing the same storage versus individually provisioning the uh, same storage to multiple hosts. Okay, so a storage practitioner obviously understands everything we just showed them. And so this will be easy for anyone who's a professional uh, service providers that are putting this to work for their customers, obviously no problem. So this is uh, uh, pretty good overall in terms of being able to quickly get this thing online. Yeah. So this is the slowest part that we encountered in the entire uh, setup, and this is what, a about three minutes or so? Yeah, and it's just assigning initiator uh, names to the host groups that you set up. Okay, so we will scoot forward the video in there, but account for three minutes for that. Now, yeah. now what do we have going on? Now we go straight to creating volumes. We have our hosts uh, configured and um, you start having fun creating volumes. So here we uh, select the pool available, give it a volume name. Um, in this case, we have volume one because it's the first volume. Uh, you can use any naming convention. I just kind of went with that. Um, give it uh, 2.5 terabytes of storage. And in this case, uh, attach the um, uh, storage to given hosts, we give it to all of them and attach. You create, you provision storage out. And that was it. Yeah. So even with little self inflicted um, delays, I mean. And you, the extra tour through the GUI, which was bonus. Yeah. I mean, you, you have very minimal time investment to get this thing up and running from day zero. And so there you have it, like dead simple, right? Yeah. It, I think it took what 12, 13 minutes. I mean, not a lot, uh, not a lot involved to get up and with no prior configuration. No, and it was just drop it in, plug it in, log in, and yeah, you had storage running from that point on. Yes, there would be some activities in the background as uh, things process, but you had storage available to you in a couple, oh, in like 10 minutes. Okay, so for in a couple minutes, you can have an ME5 online. So anyone looking at this for SMB, Edge, remote, rugged use cases. The day zero operations of being up and running are dead simple and really makes the ME5 even more valuable in those scenarios. Thanks for tuning in.